we're going to start chapter 42. Zero became strong enough to help dig the hole. When he finished, it was over six feet deep. He filled the bottom with rocks to help separate the water from the dirt. He was still the best hole digger around. That's the last hole I will ever dig, he declared, throwing down the shovel. Stanley smiled. He wished it were true, but he knew they had no choice but to eventually return to Camp Green Lake. They couldn't live on onions forever. They had been completely around the big thumb. It was like a giant sundial. They followed the shade. They were able to see out in all directions, and there was no place to go. The mountain was surrounded by desert. Zero stared at Big Thumb. It must, it must have a hole in it, he said, filled with water. You think? Well, where else could the water be coming from, Zero asked. Water doesn't run uphill. Stanley bit into an onion. It didn't burn his eyes or nose, and in fact, he no longer noticed the particularly strong taste. He remembered when he had first carried Zero up the hill, how the air had smelled bitter. It was a smell of a thousand of thousands of onions growing and rotting and sprouting. Now he didn't smell a thing. How many onions do you think we've eaten? He asked. Zero shrugged. I don't know. I don't even know how long we've even been here. Mm, I'd say a week, said Stanley. And we probably eat about 20 onions a day. So that's 280 onions, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I bet we really stink. Two nights later, Stanley lay awake staring up at the star-filled sky. He was too happy to fall asleep. He knew he had no reason to be happy. He had heard or read somewhere that right before a person freezes to death, he suddenly feels nice and warm. He wondered if, perhaps, he was experiencing something like that. It occurred to him that he couldn't remember the last time he felt happiness. It wasn't just being sent to Camp Green Lake that made his life miserable. Before that, he'd been unhappy at school where he had no friends and bullies like Derek Dune picked on him. No one liked him and the truth was he didn't especially like himself, but he liked himself now. He wondered if he was delirious. He looked over at Zero sleeping near him. Zero's face was lit in the starlight and there was a flower petal in the front of his nose that moved back and forth as he breathed. It reminded Stanley of something out of a cartoon. Zero breathed in and the petal was drawn up almost touching his nose. Zero breathed out and the petal moved towards his chin. It stayed on Zero's face for an amazingly long time before fluttering off to the side. Stanley considered placing it back in front of Zero's nose, but it wouldn't be the same. It seemed like Zero had lived at Camp Green Lake forever, but as Stanley thought about it now, he realized that Zero must have gotten there no more than a month or two before him. Zero was actually arrested the day, a day later, but Stanley's trial kept getting delayed because of baseball. He remembered what Zero had said a few days before. If Zero had just kept those shoes, neither of them would be here right now. As Stanley stared at the glittering night sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car, and he was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him in the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck him. And now he thought so again. It was more than a coincidence, it had to be destiny. Maybe they wouldn't have to return to Camp Green like he thought. Maybe they could just make it past camp and then follow the dirt road back to civilization. They could fill the sack with onions and three jars of water, and he had his canteen as well. They could refill their jars and canteen at camp. Maybe sneak into the kitchen and get some food. He doubted any of the counselors were still on guard. Everyone had to think they were dead. Buzzard food. It would mean living the rest of his life as a fugitive. The police would always be after him. At least he could call his parents and tell them that he was still alive. But he couldn't go and visit them, in case the police were watching the apartment. Although if everyone thought he was dead, they wouldn't bother to watch the apartment. Now he would have, to, now he would have to somehow get a new identity. Now I'm really thinking crazy, he thought. He wondered if a crazy person wonders if he's crazy. But even as though, as he thought this, an even crazier idea pop was popping into his head. He knew it was too crazy to even consider. Still, if he was going to be a fugitive for the rest of his life, it would help, it would help to have some money. Perhaps a treasure chest full of money? You're crazy, he told himself. Besides, just because he found the lipstick container with KB on it, that didn't mean that there was treasure buried there. It was crazy. It was all part of his crazy feeling of happiness, or maybe it was destiny. He reached over and shook Zero's arm. Hey, Zero, he whispered. Huh? Zero muttered. Zero, wake up. What? 
Do you raise his head up? What is it? Do you want to dig one more hole? Stanley asked him. All right. Chapter 43. We weren't always homeless, Zero said. I remember a yellow room. How old were you when you... Stanley started to ask, but couldn't find the right words. Moved out? I don't know. I must have been real little because I don't remember too much. I don't remember moving out. I remember standing in, the, in a crib with my mother singing to me. She held my wrists and clapped my hands together. She used to sing that song, the one you sang, but it was different though. Zero spoke slowly as if searching his brain for memories of clues. And then later, I know we lived on the street, but I don't know why we left the house. I'm pretty sure it was a house and not an apartment. And I know my room was yellow. It was late afternoon and they were resting in the shadow of the thumb. They had spent the morning picking onions and putting them in a sack. It didn't take long, but long, but long enough so they had to wait another day before heading down the mountain. They wanted to leave at first hint of daylight, so they had plenty of time to walk to, or plenty of time to make it to Camp Green Lake before dark. Stanley wanted to be sure that they could find the right hole. Then they would hide by it until everyone went to sleep. They would dig for as long as it seemed safe and not a second longer. And then, treasure or no treasure, they would head up the dirt road. If it was absolutely safe, they'd try to steal some food and water from the camp kitchen. I'm good at sneaking in and out of places, Zero said. Remember, Stanley had warned, the door to the rec room squeaks. Now he lay on his back, trying to save his strength for the long days ahead. He wondered what had happened to Zero's parents, but he didn't ask. Zero didn't like answering questions. It was better just to let him talk when he felt like it. Stanley thought about his own parents. In her last letter, his mom was worried that they might be evicting them from their apartment because of the smell of burning sneakers. They could easily become homeless as well. Again, he wondered if, he had been, if they had been told that they ran away from camp. W were they told that, they, that he was dead? An image appeared in his head of his parents hugging each other and crying. He tried not to think about it. Instead, he tried to recapture the feelings, of the, the feelings he had the night before, the inexplicable feeling of happiness, the sense of destiny. But those feelings didn't return. He just felt scared. The next morning, they headed down the mountain. They dunked their caps in the water hole before putting them on their heads. Zero held, held the shovel and Stanley carried the sack, which was crammed with onions and three jars of water. They left the pieces of broken jars on the mountain. This is where I found the shovel, Stanley said, pointing out to the patch of weeds. Zero turned and looked up, to up toward the mount top of the mountain. That's a long way. You were light, Stanley said. You had already thrown up everything that was inside of your stomach. He shifted the sack from one shoulder to the other. It was, it was heavy. He stepped on a loose rock, slipped and fell hard. The next thing he knew, he was sliding down the steep side of the mountain. He dropped the sack and onions spilled around him. He slid into a patch of weeds and grabbed onto a thorny vine. The vine ripped out of the earth, but slowed him down enough that, that he was able to stop himself. Are you all right? Stan Zero asked from above. Stanley groaned as he pulled a thorn out of the palm of his hand. Yeah, he said. He was all right, but he was worried more about the jars of water. Zero climbed down after him, retrieving the sack along the way. Stanley pulled out the thorns from his pant legs. The jars hadn't broken. The onions had protected them, like styrofoam packing material. Glad you didn't do that when you were carrying me, Zero said. They'd lost about a third of the onions, but recovered many of them as they continued down the mountain. When they reached the bottom, the sun was just driving, rising above the lake. They walked directly toward it. Soon, they stood on the edge of the cliff, looking down at the dry lake bed. Stanley wasn't sure, but he thought he could see the remains of the Mary Lou off in the distance. Are you thirsty? Stanley asked. No, said Zero. How about you? No, Stanley lied. He didn't want to be the first one to take a drink. Although they didn't mention it, it had become kind of a challenge between him and Zero. They climbed down into the frying pan. It was a different spot that they climbed up. They eased themselves down from one ledge to the other and let themselves slide into places, into other places, being especially careful with the sack. Stanley could no longer see Mary Lou, but headed in what he thought was the right direction. As the sun rose, so did the familiar haze of heat and dirt. Are you thirsty? Zero asked. No, said Stanley. Because you have three full jars of water, said Zero. I thought maybe if it was getting too heavy for you, if you drink some, it might lighten your load. I'm not thirsty, said Stanley, 
but if you want a drink, I'll give you some. Well, I'm not thirsty, said Zero. I was just worried about you. Stanley smiled. I'm a camel, he said. They walked for what seemed like a very long time and still never came across Mary Lou. Stanley was pretty sure that they were heading in the right direction. He remembered that when they left the boat, they were headed toward the setting sun, but now they headed toward the rising sun. He knew the sun didn't rise and set exactly in the east and west, more southeast and southwest, but he wasn't sure how that made a difference. His throat felt as if it were coated with sandpaper. Are you sure you're not thirsty? He asked. Not me, said Zero, but his voice was dry and raspy. When they finally did take a drink, they agreed to do it at the same time. Zero, who was now carrying the sack, set it down and took out two jars, giving one to Stanley. They decided to save the canteen for last since it couldn't, since it couldn't accidentally break. You know I'm not thirsty, Stanley said as he unscrewed the lid. I'm just drinking so you will. Well, I'm just drinking so you will, Zero said. They clinked the jars together and each watching each other poured the water in their stubborn mouths. Zero was the first to spot Mary Lou, maybe a quarter mile away and just off to the right. They headed for it. It wasn't even noon yet when they reached the boat. They sat against the shady side and rested. I don't know what happened to my mother, Zero said. She left and never came back. Stanley peeled an onion. She couldn't always take me with her, Zero said. Sometimes she had to do things by herself. Stanley had the feeling that Zero was explaining things to himself. She'd tell me to wait in certain places for her. When I was real little, I had to wait in small areas, like a porch step or a doorway. Now don't you leave here until I get back, she'd say. I never liked it when she left. I had a stuffed animal, a little giraffe, and I'd hug it the whole time she was gone. When I got bigger, I was allowed to stay in bigger areas like stay on this block or don't leave this park. But even then, I still held Jaffe. Stanley guessed that Jaffe was the name of Zero's giraffe. And then one day, she didn't come back, Zero said. His voice sounded hollow. I waited for her, her at Laney Park. Laney Park, Stanley said. I've been there. You know the playscape? Asked Zero. Yeah, I played on it. I waited there for more than a month said Zero. You know that tunnel that you can crawl through between the slide and the swinging bridge? That's where I slept. They ate four onions apiece and drank about a half jar of water. So St Stanley stood up and looked around. Everything looked the same in all directions. When I left camp, I was heading straight toward the big thumb, he said. I saw the boat off to the right, so that means we have to turn a little to the left. Zero was lost in thought. What? Okay, he said. They turned... They turned out. It was Stanley's turn to carry the sack. Some kids had a birthday party, Zero said. I guess it was about two weeks after my mother left. There was a picnic table next to the playscape and balloons were tied to it. And the kids looked to be about the same age as me. One girl said hi to me and asked if I wanted to play. I wanted to, but I didn't. I knew I didn't belong at the party even though it wasn't their playscape. There was... There was, all this, hmm, there was this one mother who kept staring at me like I was some kind of monster. Then later a boy asked me if I wanted a piece of cake. But then the same mother told me to go away. And she told all the kids to stay away from me. So I never got a piece of cake. So I ran away so fast that I forgot Jaffe. Did you ever find him? It? For a moment Zero didn't answer. And then he said, he wasn't real. Stanley thought again about his own parents. How awful it would be for them to never know if he was dead or alive. He realized that that is how Zero must have felt, not knowing what happened to his own mother. He wondered why Zero had never mentioned his father. Hold on, Zero said, stopping abruptly. We're going the wrong way. No, this is right, said Stanley. You were heading toward Big Thumb when you saw the boat off to your right. That means we should have turned right when we left the boat. Are you sure? Zero drew a, drew a diagram in the dirt. I'll show you. Um, there we go. Stanley was, wasn't, still wasn't sure. We need to go this way, Zero said, first drawing the line on the map and then heading that way himself. Stanley followed. It didn't feel right to him, but Zero seemed sure. Sometime in the middle of the afternoon, a cloud drifted across the sky and blocked out the sun. It was a welcome relief. Once again, Stanley felt that destiny was on his side. Zero stopped and held out his arm to stop Stanley too. Listen, Zero whispered. 
Stanley didn't hear anything. They continued walking very quietly and Stanley began to hear the faint sounds of Camp Green Lake. They were still too far away to see the camp, but they could hear the blend of indistinct voices. As they got closer, he occasionally could hear Mr. Sir's distinctive bark. They walked slowly and quietly, aware that sounds travel in both directions. They approached a cluster of holes. Let's wait here until they go in, said Zero. Stanley nodded. He checked to make sure that there was nothing living in it and then climbed down into the hole. Zero climbed into the one right next to him. Despite having gone the wrong way for a while, it hadn't taken them nearly as long as Stanley expected. Now, now they just had to wait. The sun cut through the cloud and Stanley felt its rays beating down on him. But soon more clouds filled the sky, Stanley sh or shading Stanley and his hole. He waited until he was certain that the last of the campers had finished for the day, and then he waited a little longer. As quietly as possible, he and Zero climbed out of their holes and crept towards camp. Stanley held the sack in front of him, cradling it in his arms instead of over his shoulder to keep the jars from clanking against each other. A wave of terror rushed over him when he saw the compound, the tents, the rec room, the warden's cabin under the two oak trees. The fear made him dizzy. He took a breath and summoned his courage and continued. That's the one he whispered, pointing to the hole where he found the gold tube. It was still about 50 yards away, but Stanley was pretty sure it was the right hole. There was no need to risk going any closer. They climbed down into the adjacent holes and waited for the camp to fall asleep.